we are really very fortunate that professor dipankar chatterji a shanti swarup batnagar laureate honorary professor of molecular biology unit indian institute of science bangalore has accepted our invitation and agreed to give this useful webinar so i will warmly welcome professor dipankar chatterji to our institute and i also welcome other panelists which includes professor uh, our honorary uh, provost professor j s yadav sir our dean madam our dean school of science professor bharti dave ma'am uh, my colleagues uh, our uh, hod of bioengineering dr vijay uh, dr vijay singh uh, my other faculty colleagues uh, dr kiran patruni who is also a prof assistant professor in bioengine uh, biosciences then dr arin gosai and dr ritu and so we will begin with the opening remarks by dr j s yadav sir our provost we are really blessed to have dr yadav sir as our mentor uh, he is a world renowned organic chemist who is known for his innovations and application oriented research and has served as director of iict hyderabad and scaled it to new heights his dedication towards research can be understood by the fact that sir has published more than 1300 publications with more than 10 27000 plus citations and 150 plus patents sir has received both shanti swarup batnagar award and jc bose national fellowship and he has guided more than 250 phd students and is still guiding students at iu our university is progressing very fast under his exemplary leadership so sir i request you to please share your uh, experiences with professor dipankar chatterjee sir and kindly uh, give the opening remarks it uh, i'm dear all i'm sure you know somebody is going to introduce him hiren and gosai only i can tell him that i know him for almost uh, close to 35 years maybe yes yes, yes. So i joined iict hyderabad and he was in ccmb and uh, I meet with our Bal Subramanian Balu. He was Bal Subramanian. We call him mostly Balu. So he was his very colleague. And always, he, if you ask him any time, he would be talking about the Pankaj. And and couple of time we met, uh, you know, Basera Hotel also. You remember? <laughs> <laughs> so the, and he has been, you know, even his wife was working with the ICT in the polymer division. One of the she was. Terrific publication. She has very good publication. She used to publish in very good journal in Palimer, and actually she also made uh, ICT felt Palimer in area internationally. Anyway, so Dipankar uh, we knew, and uh, you know, uh, I would say that he left <laughs> yeah, join ICT Bangalore. And, uh, I'm sure he did very well there, but our contact continued. We never uh, stopped. is continue whenever he will come to hyderabad we will meet and i go to ic bangalore also we will see is a gem of a person and one thing i'll tell you he one of the successful scientists in the biological sciences that's why I, university you know is is more towards uh, you know life science so i felt that you should give a lecture and inspire people to take biology as a career you know in this part of country people don't prefer biology they prefer you know uh, the normally commerce m com b com economics and all those things so we have lecture like in chemistry earlier then we have chemical engineering and the biological sciences just before you mohan rao spoke so we main objective of this is that let this area people know that biological sciences are very important and you have a good career in take biology as your career you know there are so many unexplored things in biology <coughs> there you know is huge research career we have understood we gone to moon gone everywhere but we have not understood our own body yet we don't know how it's happening and i don't know how with all this going innovation research i don't see it very we are close to understand our own body and of course so, so many things are there 
So I felt this is the area is still open, very virgin area, biological sciences. And for, if you want to make career, research career in biology, the best subject. Anyway, I, you'll hear more from Professor Deepak Chatterjee. Only I'll say that normally friendship never die. And as a friend, he, when I asked him, he said yes. And he agreed to be with us today. Nidhi, it is all yours now. Yes, thank you so much, sir, for this very nice introduction about uh, Professor Dipankar, sir. And I request now uh, our Dean School of Science, Professor Bharti Dave, madam, to give a brief introduction about Intrashil University. Uh, so, a very good morning to all. On behalf of our Provost, sir, Dr. Yadav, and on behalf of Intrashil University, we warmly welcome Professor Dipankar Chatterjee. And I should really say that uh, we are, Indrashil University is really very fortunate. It is just due to Yadav, sir, okay, we are into the third year, and we are fortunate to be introduced to all the Patnagar awardees and Jesse Bose National Fellows of our country. So to just give you a very brief profile of our university to today's speaker, as well as the new attendees, uh, the source of inspiration behind establishing this university is Sri Indravadan Bhai A. Modi, the founder chairman of Kedila Pharmaceuticals Limited, a core nationalist at heart, I should say, and he truly believed that medicines should be affordable and should be made available, should be affordable to the poorest of the poor of this country. And this care is still being continued at Kedila Pharmaceuticals Limited. So Indrashil University was established as a philanthropic initiative of our beloved chancellor, Dr. Rajiv I. Modi, in loving memory of his parents, Sri Indravadan Ambalal Modi and Srimati Sheila Ben Modi, who laid the foundation stone of Kerala Pharmaceuticals in 1951. So if we see to the beginning of his historical journey of success, Initially, when Kedila Pharmaceuticals was established in 1951, it was just in one small room of a village named as Hasot in Baruch district of Gujarat. And uh, to uh, Indravadan Pai, you know, uh, started this Kedila Pharmaceuticals marketing and selling his products by riding on a cycle 30 to 40 kilometers per day. His wife, Srimati Sheila Ben Modi, was the first employee of Kedila Pharmaceuticals. And it, she was a constant source of inspiration to Indravadan by Modi to first manufacture the indigenous gripe water of our country, and which has brought smiles to millions of parents across our country. So to honor their legacy of care and compassion, the university's governing body and Dr. Rajiv Modi are determined to holistically transform and de develop this university into a hallmark of global excellence, both in terms of research as well as in terms of uh, academics. So it was his firm belief in a self-reliant pharmaceutical industry and his commitment to research and innovation that remain his lifelong mantra. And it is from him that we have derived this inspiration. If we see to the milestones of success of our university, we are into the third year, a small, pre a small but beautiful university. As I said, it was established in 1951. And now it is the leading pharmaceutical company in India with its presence in 90 different countries, more than 10,000 employees. And they first took up an education initiative in 2016 by establishing Sri Saraswati Education Foundation. But it was in 2018 that Indrashil University has been established as the first life sciences university of our country. I think Professor Chatterjee, Chatterjee would be interested in this. And seeing to the success of our university, it was in 2019 that Atal, uh, you can say Niti Ayo, Government of India has supported us with Atal Incubation Center with its flagship program to encourage youth of our country and specifically Gujarat to initiate startups and become future entrepreneurs of our country. Again in 2019-20, within the same year, Indrashil Innovative Foundation was sanctioned to us by exclusively by Government of Gujarat. Again, to support uh, young entrepreneurs. In 2020-21, Industries Commissionerate of Gujarat has supported us just before one or two months with a nodal agency for promoting startup and innovation for the students and young innovators of Gujarat. So for the students, we have three platforms. If they have any novel idea, they can develop this into a sustainable business. As I always say, the success of any institute depends on the mentor. We have as our leader, Dr. J.S. Yadav, 
one of the best known organic chemist of our country, FNA, FNSC, FTWAS. He is the provost of Indrashil University. He was the former director of Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, Hyderabad. He has been awarded with Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, JC Bose National Fellow, a number of patents to his credit, plus 150, a number of publications, about 1,400, 250 PhD students, and still we have uh, about 11 to 12 students working with him for their PhD, a number of citations, say, for example, about uh, 27,000. And the success, as I've said, depends on the mentor, and you can see the, the reason why Indrashil University progressed to this level is just because of his supervision and his guidance and his mentorship. So why Indrashil University? That is the question usually that is asked to us. One pillar of our strength is academic excellence, both in terms of teaching, both in, in terms of research, with excellent faculty that we have. All of them are PhDs, all of them are postdocs from two to three different countries. They have served in national institutes. We provide enough industrial exposure because one of our very first objective is to make the students industry ready. And the exposure that we give is in terms of internship to industries, their placement to industries. We focus on overall development of the students and we have tried to achieve global academic standards. So under the umbrella of Indrashil University, we have School of Science, School of Engineering. School of Engineering uh, offers BTEC in Computer Science and Engineering, Mechanical Engineering, Chemical and Biochemical Engineering. School of Science offers BSc Honours in Chemistry, BSc of Honours in Biosciences. Our first university in Gujarat to offer Honours degree at an undergraduate level. So we have MSc Chemistry, MSc in Animal Biology, MSc in Microbiology, and we offer research programs under both these schools. So in terms of global academic standards, we have collaborations with international universities, one of which is Sacred Heart University, Tuskegee University, both USA, University of Newcastle, Australia. At present, it is for computer science and engineering, where the students would be earning a dual degree. They would be doing three years at our university, one year at their university, and they would be uh, awarded degrees both from Indrashil University as well as International University. So having Dr. J.S. Yadav as our provost, we have highly sophisticated state-of-the-art laboratory facilities with highly sophisticated instruments, HPLC, GCMS, FTIR, IR, etc. But a recent addition is nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which costs around 4.5 to 5 crores of rupees and which is available to our PG as well as our this thing. Uh, research students. So we are even the, our first university which has NMR and which is available to PG as well as research students. We have entered into as our new education policy 2020 says the university should be associated with industries. We are associated with our parent company Cadera Pharmaceuticals, Karnavati Engineering, CII, EDI Entrepreneurship Development Institute of India, three to four CSIR laboratories, one of which is IICT, CSMCRI at Bhavnagar, National Chemical Laboratory at Pune, Apollo Hospitals, Ratnaman Industries, et cetera, where our students are uh, placed for uh, internship as well as placements. So at Indrashil University, as I've said, we have three platforms, one of which is Atal Incubation Center. The second is Indrashil Uni Innovative Foundation supported by government of Gujarat. And recently the third one uh, supported by Industries Commissionerate. So in these incubation uh, centers, what we provide is world-class, uh, access to research and development laboratories. Uh, we provide 50 lakh as kickstart support, two crores as seed fund support, hand holding by renowned mentors. They may be from industry, government institutes, etc. Uh, we provide overall support if they want to take up their startup to a sustainable business. So this is our website where they can visit. Uh, in case of any inquiries, they can contact at this email and they can contact the person concerned. So with this brief introduction, I hand over to Dr. Nidhi. Thank you, please. Thank you so much, madam. Thank you so much for uh, your kind introduction of the university. And now I request uh, Dr. Arain Gosai to uh, please uh, formally introduce our uh, honorary guest, Professor Dipanka Chatterjee, sir. Uh, thank you, Nidhi, madam. And uh, good morning to one and all present here. Today, this task of introducing our speaker of this webinar is a great privilege. I know this is difficult, but the thought that he is a man of virtue and science. I feel elated to introduce him to everyone today. After all, he is a living inspiration to all of us budding scientists. 
So, Professor Dibankar Chatterjee is a molecular biologist and the honorary professor at Molecular Biology Biophysics Unit, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Sir is known for his pioneering research on bacterial transcription. Sir is a recipient of Shanti Swarup Patnagar Prize, a Jesse Bowles National Fellow, and a Homi Baba Fellow. The Government of India awarded him the fourth highest civilian honor of the Padma Shri in 2016 for his contribution to science and engineering. Sir has completed his graduate and postgraduate degree at Chadavar University, Kolkata. He has complete, completed his PhD in molecular biology from the Indian Institute of Science in 1973, after which he started his career as a faculty member at the School of Life Sciences of University of Hyderabad in 1979. This was followed by a stint at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and at Stony Brook University for his postdoctoral research. And Sir returned to India in 1999 to join the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology, that is CCMB, Hyderabad, as a research assistant before moving to the Molecular Bio Biophysics Unit of IISA Bangalore, where he became the chair of the Biology and Genetics Unit, a post he held till 2005. Sir is known to have done research on bacteria such as Escherichia coli and Mycobacterium tuberculosis, as well as the omega factor with regard to the bacterial transcription mechanism and genome expression. Sir is an adjunct professor of the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, IISA, Kolkata, and holds the distinguished research professorship of the Institute of Life Sciences, Hyderabad. His research have been documented by way of over 150 articles published in peer-reviewed international journals and he mentors 31 research scholars in his laboratory. Sir is a recipient of the IISC Alumnus Award and is the president of Indian Institute of Science. He has served as a visiting fellow at National Institute of Genetics, Japan and John Hopkins University and has served as a council member of the Indian National Science Academy from 2002 to 2004. If one takes a closer look at the alchemy of the achieving person, two distinct virtues can pop up. That is hard work and pioneering spirit. Sir is a live example of having these those virtues. So Sir will enlighten about the central dogma of molecular biology, action of antibiotics. And uh, I now warmly welcome Sir to take the mic and enlighten us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So please, we are very eager to hear your Wonderful webinar. Thank you. Let me share the screen. Yes. Can you see the screen? Sir, not yet. One minute. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Shall I start? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gosai, for your kind introduction. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi, for your introduction. And mostly, I should thank my very good friend, Dr. Riado, for inviting me for this. I was not aware of this place because it's very new, 2018. However, from the Dean and also from Dr. Riado, I came to know about this place and it's so satisfactory for me to come and see, talk with the students. Yadov is a good friend. We have, I know, each, we know each other from 1987 or 88. I don't forget the year now, but we are in very close contact and various forum. And I always admire his spirit. I'm so happy that he is with this place. He's a new place he selected to mentor. And I'm sure under his leadership, this place will be high, attend very much heights. Now, I selected this topic to talk on because I work on this place directly in this area for very many years now. And as I proceed line by line, slide by slide, I will, it will make it clear to you how I am connected with this area. I find we are very old timers. Yadav will know that we are old timers. As a result of which, I don't feel very comfortable in online talks. But the situation is so now we have to. I'm continuously giving online talks because unless I see, I was telling Dr. Nidhi before the start of the meeting 
that I like to see the face of the audience so that I can have a body contact on, you know, I have a, I can see how they're reacting when anybody's sleeping or not, but here I can't guess anybody's not liking it. So if you're not liking it, you can stop me anytime. You can share the scheme or you can raise your hand. We can, I can answer your questions. Central dogma of molecular biology actually is a very simple thing. It makes only one thing. The DNA is the core of all material, all everything on living species. DNA is the basis of all organism. And DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and protein do the all function. That is the simplest term, the central dogma of molecular biology. And the term was coined by no other than the great man, Francis Creek, who discovered DNA double helical structure, fiber diffraction pattern, by a classic publication in 1953, I'll show you that paper. And later he, ordered, he coined the term central dogma. Why he used the term dogma? Why he used the word dogma? He said the DNA makes RNA, RNA also can make DNA, but once from RNA to protein it makes, it gets locked into the protein conformation, the structure, it can never be reversed. So that is very dogma. There's a dogma of the whole biological concept is that one protein is made, they help the conversion of DNA to RNA again, but the same protein will not go back to RNA and they go back to DNA. So that is the part of the dogma it is. And now we understand that at every point of our action of antibiotics or survival or living species, we can manipulate the DNA formation to RNA. We can manipulate RNA to protein formation at every stage and we can see what is happening and we can see the living species how they behave. So it becomes a very nice actionable target, actionable metabolic pathway through which an organism can be manipulated. And as you can, as we are living in the COVID situation, you know, everybody is trying to see how we can, we can kill a virus, how we can handle a virus when they're infection human host. They are also, it is a central dogma. Most of the inhibitors which are coming, which are by protein protein interaction or RNA dependent RNA polymerase, they are trying to target those actions. So, the action of drugs, whether it is antibiotics or not, I'll explain that again in future, if you, in subsequent slides, is a very questionable thing. So, that is the point on the premises on which I'll start my talk DNA to RNA to RNA to protein. Francis Creek is the person, is a one of the biggest biological heads person in 20th century. There is an institute in his name in England. Creek Institute, there is a road in his name also. <clears throat> I am very fortunate to have seen him in 1987 because he came to inaugurate CCMB, organized CSL Lab, CSCMB. He was the first speaker, he inaugurated it. Our then director, Dr. P.M. Bhargava, was a good friend of Dr. Francis Creek. I remember it is such an awesome feeling now when I look back. I received him in the airport. I took him to the CCMB guest house and talked with him. I could never imagine that what a great man he is by simply, from his simplicity and from his talk. And now when I look back, I is a pleasurable memory. In fact, he, he signed a DNA double helical structure model which he built up in CCMB. He signed it and it is in CCMB. CCMB library. Anybody goes there, one can see it. Anyway, in my next slide, I will show you that. Let me go to the next slide. Yeah, this is the DNA double helix. I am showing it. And in this double helix, you will see the, this is the molecule. There are two strands wrapping around each other. And now, if it is a knowledge of the school boys, school textbook, it is there. So I will not spend much time on this structure. These are the specific base pairs which line up. They design the DNA sequence. And from this sequence, a single strand of RNA is made and then the protein comes out. So this is the whole path of the molecule. And if we look at the structure of an organism, we'll see there are level, several levels of organization. Level one has a monomeric unit of nucleotides that will have, and protein will have amino acids, cell wall will have sugars. 
So a cell is made of nucleic acid, cell is made of protein, cell of made of the cell wall, membranes, everything. And if you look at this, Dr. Yadav must have told all of you this many, many times. The basis of these are organic molecules, organic structures. The sugars which makes the cell wall, sugars make the cover it up. They interact also. They play a very major role in, or, in separation, organization, defining the geometry of a particular cell. They make the cellulose the structure. Then comes the protein which are makes from amino acid. Again, organic molecule which makes the protein. Protein makes the membrane, membrane protein. And then the structure is developed. And then comes that nucleotide DNA which makes the monomeric unit is the organic structure. Phosphate, sugar, bad base. They make the DNA, then make the supramolecular structure, chromosome, which comes into that. So the base sequence present in DNA makes RNA, makes protein. And the base sequence define your everything you possible in your body. So much so now people are telling that your is a very important area. The people, students who are developing their career, I should tell them, when you read biology, please remember these things which are coming up now. Next 20 years, this is a major topic, I think, will happen. If I am much younger, then 30 years younger, I would have started this area to work on. That your what you eat, what is your gut, all your gut, we call it gut microbiome, all the kind of bacteria present in your gut, they define your behavior, your anger, your depression, your disease pattern. And so there is a connection between the gut and brain. So gut-brain axis is the most important area now developing. In the last two years, it's so new. Any top journals, if you take, you will see so many papers on gut mic. So the molecules which are making the bacteria, which are making the gut, their DNA organization, their RNA organization, their protein molecules, their sugars, everything will define their interaction of your many mood, anxiety, behavior, everything. So this, this is a gut micro interaction gut brain axis. So this is the organization of the structure and we look at how this structure was basically coming to the play, into the behavior, coming to the play of the action of antibiotics, how to resist the organization, infection, etc. Discovery of DNA, this is a wrong, I'm so, sorry for this, this is 1869, it was done wrong back and then three people are mostly connected with this Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and Francis Kirk, James Watson. This is the McCarthy. These are the people who are responsible for the DNA structure. People used to think that DNA is structure is basically protein is the basic life molecule, but that is not the case. It's the DNA which is the life molecule. And these are the people who organized on this structure mostly, worked on this. And this is a lady who you might have heard the name, Rosalind Franklin, who took the first photograph of the DNA structure. This is an amazing feat, I must tell you. Unfortunately, she died very early, before the Nobel Prize was given. The Nobel Prize is never given posthumously. So she missed the Nobel Prize. But it was obvious that she will get the prize because she is the person who took a DNA fiber and took this original picture, took in 19... 49, I think, if I'm 49 or 50. She took this particular structure first and showed that the reflection of the DNA in X fiber diffraction pattern coming crosswise. There is a meridian plane and the reflection are coming and this is a constant base, dif constant difference in the gate, depth of the images. And crystallographic knowledge and fiber diffraction knowledge told her, told everybody that this must be a double helical structure. It's a crosswise structure. There is two strands crossing each other. And this gives, gave the all parameters of the structure. And this is a diffraction images, discovery of the double helix. From this kind of image, even now you people are finding it difficult to get it. So, and with the primitive equipment, she pictured this image in her laboratory. And from the basis of this structure, the finally Orson and Creek came up with the double helical structure. And this lecture was given by both Francis Crick and Jim Watson at CCMB Hyderabad several years back, several decades back. But they said when the structure was made, they were so happy and they, they came up and discussed this structure with the press and that press took the photograph. 
and 1962 Nobel Prize was given to them. I think I have a picture for that. Yes, here it is. You have the picture of several Nobel Prize winners. 1962 is a classic year who had the top molecular biologist and protein chemist got the Nobel Prize. This is Maurice Wilkinson got in medicine. Peru from the chemistry because he got the structure of myoglobin. Francis Creek. Here is a American author, John Steinbeck, who got it for literature. Jim Watson got it for DNA helix, again for biology. And this is Ken Drew for hemoglobin structure. All of them together is very interesting. Linus Pauling, the greatest chemist of the 20th century, he, he was also working on DNA structure, but some he could not win the race. But he did not attend the ceremony, though he was getting a second Nobel Prize and the same year for peace because of his working on Vietnam, anti-Vietnam protest. So this is the structure on which the award was given. And this is the paper. I will request all the students who are listening to this talk, please take a note of it. This is a classic paper, please read it. And the English of this paper is so beautiful. I'll tell my, all my students, such a simple, humble way of presenting a 950 words of paper, you know, two page in nature, which is a which is a citation classic, which is a classic in its own right, or the historically the most momentous discovery, which changed, shook the world. So much so now, even everybody talks about DNA is not right, our DNA is bad or good and all that. DNA fingerprinting. So this is the paper which was published in 1953, 25th April, I think. And they start the sentence, we used to suggest that structure of deoxydiagonucleic acid, which has novel feature. Very simple English it is written. And this is the structure they proposed, which was found to be right. So this is the structure of the molecule. Now, how the molecule structure goes all along, where a double-stranded DNA comes up and it stands in several mechanisms is known. DNA, double-stranded DNA gets separated and over one strand RNA synthesis happens by base pairing. There is a specificity of the base pairing DNA. A, adenine binds with thymine and guanosine, but guanine binds with cytosine, ATGC pair, three hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds. Let's not go into all those details, those who know it, it's a very textbook knowledge, you can look at it. But single-stranded RNA it comes, so this is the transcription, DNA makes RNA, RNA is single strand. It comes from the one strand of the double helix, and then it makes protein. To make this particular structure, you will see what happens, that there is an enzyme which reads out, you know, very specifically reads out. Now you should appreciate, all the students are sitting here should appreciate, that if DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, and the sequence of the DNA is so important, then if I start somewhere else, Suppose this is the portion I should get RNA and the protein should come with the genetic code. If I start somewhere else, I will get a wrong message, get a wrong protein. It should not be allowed. So the start point should be specific. We should know the start point exactly where it is coming. And if I know the start point, then I know the where to put enzyme should come and bind and how the translation of the transcription of RNA will happen. And once RNA transcription happens, ribosome comes and makes some translation. So that's how the process goes. The enzyme which does this is a enzyme called RNA polymerase. Name signifies it polymerizing RNA synthesis. And it is a multi-subunit protein. It has several subunits. So you work on this enzyme extensively for the last four decades. And they bind different position. Each subunit has a function. They bind to different position of DNA and specifically, and the enzyme is making the RNA and the phosphodiester bond is formed. In a bacteria, smallest organism, we have subunit, same function shows in archaea, same is eukaryote, getting complicated, three different kinds. Let's not go into all the details, but they have the same function. They bind to DNA at a specific site. We call promoter sequence, which makes the RNA, and then it translates to protein. The assembly process is a very interesting process. Over the decades, people worked on, we also worked on this for a very long time. The two alpha subunit comes together and bind, make this alpha 2. Then it, next one subunit comes, make it alpha 2 beta. These are all crystallographically defined. We know exactly how it happens. 
And by the time the next one comes, it's called beta prime binds with another small subunit omega. They come together and make the whole enzyme. And this is the active site. This molecule has the active site and DNA chain passes through inside it. DNA goes through it. And as it goes, these two mouth of a animal or fish or whatever you call it, they move. And as it moves, DNA passes around and the transcription or RNA synthesis happen, taking into the message from the DNA while it is bound. So that's how the whole process goes on. And this is the enzyme crystallographically defined, crystallographically shown. I have shown you the same structure in more detail. This crystallographic structure is known for now two decades. DNA passes through this hole, basically. And as it passes, it makes the RNA. And one strand of the DNA makes RNA. And that RNA subsequently makes protein. The structure of the enzyme is same all through. Every organism, I showed you RNA polymerase from bacterial RNA polymerase, archaeal polymerase, eukaryotic RNA polymerase, all have the same structure. And the same structure have the same function with minute differences even the higher organisms, and therefore it is very important. Functionally, it's very important. The DNA comes, double helical DNA, I showed you, it comes, we showed it, that it binds to RNA polymerase straight, and once it binds particularly, it's called such mechanism, it tries to find out where to bind, when they find what, because I told you, if it binds in a wrong place, wrong message will come. So it binds in the right position, and then it bends the DNA and the opening of strands takes place. This is the direction it bending takes place. Once it bends DNA open up happening and this open position, single strand is formed. And once the single strand is formed, then that position, new nucleotides come and makes RNA. So DNA to RNA goes on the formation like it's exactly the same way. These are very long, and this is the message. Long time people worked on this. So the phosphorester bond formation takes place. Here the DNA, double helical DNA, where the single strand is formed, over which the RNA comes and RNA comes and sits there. Formation is very interesting. Those who are organic chemistry, because it's, you know, Yadovji is there and your chemistry is, I'm sure, is very strong. Phosphodiester bond formation is a simple chemistry here. DNA message comes from the template, but as the RNA synthesis is going on, there is a hydroxyl group. I'm trying to show you this hydroxyl group. This gets deprotonated, generating O minus. This O minus is a nucleophilic center where the incoming nucleotide, in a, which will come and see this, there is a T. So there should be specifically A base should be there. So the message template tells you which base to come. So A comes and there is a comes as a triphosphate. And there is a phos three phosphate groups are attached to this. This is the position, a phosphor, P double bond O, P double bond O, P double bond O. They get polarized, becomes an electrophilic center. O minus becomes a nucleophilic center. It goes and sits over this P, say SN2 attack, basically a typical SN2 attack, 180 degree to each other. And this beta, this beta gamma phosphate leaves this position. And this attack makes, and this phosphate goes out, and that's how it makes the phosphodiester bond. So this is the chemistry, simple chemistry. We worked on this. We found out the geometry of this several years back. When I was in CCMB, we showed what is the structure of this particular molecule at that at the active site. So now point is, which I want to spend more time on this, I'll talk, talk more on antibiotics. Obviously, if you can, you can imagine, anybody can tell me this that if the central dogma is so important in life and it is doing such an important job, then anywhere, if I can attack DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, cell wall or protein synthesis, I'll be able to kill an action, antibiotic, bacteria. What is the advantage? Now, one is smart student will ask me the question that we are living species, a bacteria when infecting us or a virus when infecting us, they are also living species. Why an antibiotic will kill the bacteria and the virus, not us, not affecting us? Reason is very simple, and we are so lucky on this that the RNA polymerase 
or the ribosomes or DNA polymerase, where the activatic action of antibiotic can take place. They're different from what is in a bacteria or a virus in a human host. Structurally different. So the inhibitor which will kill a bacterial infection will never touch a human host. So if I can have an antibiotic which will only touch in the RNA synthesis mechanism in the bacteria or the some specific regions of virus polymerases, it will not touch the human host as a result of which it will not affect the human host. For it to us, this is very lucky for us to have that. So very long back when antibiotics was not discovered, this was known. So people used to give bacteriophage to kill or infect bacterial infection, infection by a virus. And you eat, drink the virus, it will kill the bacteria, not the host, like that. So yeah, so I can, I can accommodate, I can, I can play around with this. I can attack the cell wall, I can attack the DNA RNA synthesis. And of course, ribosome, I don't want to talk about it because all of you know that 2009 Nobel Prize was given to one Indian, one of the recipients was an Indian, Penki Ramakrishnan, who was studied in Baroda, who studied in Baroda. He got the, because he showed how the antibiotics in, binds ribosome and kill the protein synthesis. So if I stop RNA synthesis and protein synthesis, I can kill a bacteria and therefore I can give antibiotic resistance. I can generate antibiotic resistance, bacterial resistance. So that is the way the process goes, the chemistry of the system goes. And I will straight now come to tuberculosis because that is the infection which is killing us tremendously. And I will show you how antibiotic action can kill a tuberculosis bacteria and play around with, with the play around with the central dogma of molecular biology. Long, long back, you know, if you look at the killing disease, it is important disease in mankind because if you consider fatalities, this is worse than any disease like plague, cholera, and anything. That tuberculosis, maximum people are dying out of tuberculosis, a silent killer. India has a very high load of TB tuberculosis burden. And Robert Koch, 1882, received it. He discovered, he received Nobel Prize in 1905. Silent killer. People found out, fortuitously, by luckily, that there is an antibiotic called rifampicin. I'll show you the structure. Rifampicin act on TB bacteria specifically. And it is still today, 2021, it is one of the strongest drug for anti-tuberculosis. Now there are no modifications have come. There are two, three different kinds of modifications have come. Two, three drugs come together. But in a multi-drug therapy, rifampicin is still the most important drug for anti-tuberculosis, tuberculosis action against tuberculosis. So that's how it is. It is. And these are the different drugs for different anti-action of antibiotic isoniazide, rifampicin. Rifampine, pyrazomide, rifambutol, etc. And we have second line antibiotic, third line, several new ones have come. So, this kind of action of antibiotics basically are there to kill the RNA polymerase and DNA gyrase and various others or ribosomes to control the bacterial infection. I showed you before there is a killer disease, one third of the world population is remain infected with tuberculosis, it's a very high amount of infection. These are the various tuberculosis, like avium, you know, hot tweeters, cholera, this kind of different infection, mycobacterial infection can take place. And we now know what happened, you know, this very important message I must tell you. That when tuberculosis, rifampicin was discovered, was found there is a very good antibacterial anti-tuberculosis. Immediately the tuberculosis infection came down. There's a fall on tuberculosis infection. And people thought, everybody thought around 1960s and 1970s that we got rid of tuberculosis from this world, but that is not the case. You may kill, you get infected, you may kill out of 100, 99, 98% population, but there will be one or two percent population of the bacteria which will remain inside you, which will avoid the onslaught of the drug. 
and they will remain as a dormant, there is the most non replicative dormant stage. They are called persistence. They will remain and they will not, will not be able to catch them. They are called mild drug resistance, extra drug resistance, MDR, XDR, trivi, tuberculosis. You cannot catch them by any antibiotic, reform patient will not touch them. And when you are immunologically compromised, you are old person or any other disease, then those non-replicative ones, dormant ones will resurface, come up and kill you. So they are, people call it, very interesting English term people use, it called winning by waiting. They wait in the body and when you, they wait for the host to lose their, lose their status, lose their immunological capabilities as a result of which they get compromised, immunologically compromised and then they get they resurface in a weak adult. So that's how the mechanism of tuberculosis drugs happen. And they have a tremendous potential to stay inside. Like even 3,000 year old Egyptian mummies, when they are taken out and cultured, the lungs tissue showed the presence of, you can culture tuberculosis from the lungs tissue which are lying dormant in a mummy for thousands of years. So therefore, it's a dangerous thing to handle. So the question is, all out question is how you handle dormant TBs for making them susceptible for antibiotic resistance. So there are MDR, XDR kind of things. So many drugs are being tried for this. There are two, one of the reasons for them is mode of action is take the dormant and somehow make them replicative, some treatment. Once they are replicative, any drug can attack, attack them. Because dormant TB or persistent TB, you cannot attack with any drug because they are very, very resistant to that. So it has a tremendous fallout, you know. We have done it in our, in our laboratory, these kind of experiments and it showed by simply taking the two mycobacterium spegmatis, which is the model of tuberculosis. If you have a high glucose media, they're replicative and they're going very well. But the moment you remove the food, they don't die. They get, they get saturated with the less glucose and they look different and their structure becomes a little bit different, very smooth surface. And they, they can, you can keep them and culture them inside the cells. So you cannot kill them under any circumstance, not by giving the food but they will remain dormant and stay for an, op an opportunity to resurface again. So that is the mechanism by which the whole thing works in the case of mycobacterium, any bacterial infection. This is the structure of Evampicin. We know how it binds bionopolymerase, how it inhibits the transcription. And the mechanism now is very well studied. But unfortunately, this molecule is not so effective against polymerase which is coming from a non-replicative and dormant microorganism. It binds to the different positions and of the, blocks the pathway of RNA transcription and block the pathway of, uh, by binding to different position of the RNA polymerase. And we know exactly how the molecule binds to the structure. And it goes inside this hole I showed you through the DNA chain process. Once it goes and sits there, DNA chain cannot go and exit out as a result of which RNA synthesis is inhibited. So this is a basic mechanism by which several of these things happen. I'll show you that it, this action of antibiotics also can be at the level of DNA, A, or other kind of proteins which interacts with RNA polymerase. One of them I'll show you is RBPA, which interacts with polymerase and inhibits the transcription mechanism. So the structure of RNA polymerase bound to RNA, bound to DNA or structure of RNA polymerase bound to reform PCN has been worked out. And more or less, we are now quite okay. Within the last 10 years, we have we know now how the mechanism of RNA polymer is moving over DNA, how the transcription is proceeding, so on and so forth. But the point which remains very important for us that to find out this is the site where the reform piscine is binding and how the inhibition of transcription is monitored in these cases. We could not touch a non-replicative or a dormant organism 
we do not know yet. And there are some new drugs are coming in the market, like mixopyrosin and all the, all the others. And people are working on the mechanism of them in fact, from various angles. So the mechanism has been worked out in great details. Two more so our pacing inhibition happens. Steric hindrance and allosteric inhibition, both are happening at the level of DNA and RNA polymerase interaction. So that's how the central dogma of molecular biology can be tackled to infect, kill the infection in bacteria, bacterial infection. It is so much so smart that we have generated in our laboratory when a student comes, summer student comes to work. Many times they do this kind of experiment. If you grow them in a plate, in Spegmat is a non-infectious non model of tuberculosis. In growing different, different concentration of antibiotics, and if you go from smaller concentration to higher concentration, low concentration to high concentration, in the process of that, you develop antibiotic resistance. And those antibiotic resistance organisms, when you study them, you find there are certain mutations which are conserved. These mutations, like you, you hear about the mutation in the case of COVID, that they infect the organism mutate as a result of which they become more infective or if any, they, any drug cannot attack them. Basically the same principle. Here the mutations happen in such a way, they become refumpicin resistant as a result of which an organism, a host infected with the bacteria with the refumpicin resistant mutation will never be attacked by refumpicin. So the question is how the mutation happens. I told you, very important point a student can match, can notice it, that if I infect it with a, if I grow the organism in a low concentration of antibiotic, I'll generate mutation. So therefore, if, I doc if a doctor prescribes me antibiotic, I don't take the full course, I finish it because I get feeling good I, and antibiotics are expensive. I don't eat the full course. I eat only small amount of courses. Then I'm killing the bacteria, no doubt, replicative ones, but the dormant ones is lying back because they are remaining in a low concentration of antibiotics as a result of which they become resistant. So that is the most dangerous situation we are facing. So antibiotic resistance is a phenotype acquired by bacteria during prolonged treatment due to selective pressure. I am sure you, every one of you understand what we mean by that. If I prolong treatment, and do a selective pressure, they become resistant. But like mutations of the antibiotic binding site, which I showed you already, we can generate it in our laboratory. I can also generate in a phenotypic acquired by bacteria during prolonged treatment. As a result of which, a target, a target is an entry and process which should unique structural functional property, RNA polymerase. I have explained in great detail. It's not the case, always several targets are promised to us entering the task discovery law. So there's a target can be promiscuous, so I can have a problem of drug discovery, which you are facing in the case of in the case of non-replicative dormant RNA polymers. But you see this, this is the most dangerous slide. Anywhere you deploy antibiotic, human beings have done it in that once with the nation comes coming up. It may happen in the case of COVID, when the civilization progress that I, in fact, I discovered antibiotics in 1930, and by 35, antibiotic resistance is observed. So you find MPC, anyone, vancomycin, erythromycin, methicillin, tetracycline, penicillin, anywhere you develop an antibiotic, antibiotic deployed, you enter sulfonamide, toramphenicol, tetracycline, vancomycin, methicillin, like anyone you develop, within five to 10 years, new resistance comes. Because of our bad use, because of the organism's prolonged treatment, they develop a mutation in the DNA. So the effect is in the central dogma. And this is creating a major problem for us. So it is, therefore, in a post-antibiotic era in which common infection and minor injuries will not be able to treat. If there is resistance, how can you treat them? All the animal feed, all the non-vegetarians who are eating chicken, meat, and all that, they are all eating animals which are antibiotic treated to pro protect them from infection. As a result of which all of them are meat plus this is a tremendous bad combination. So if you eat those chickens, you are developing antibiotic resistance yourself. So therefore, this is the problem we are facing now. 
a day is not far away. Warning came in 2014 that we may have an apocalypse situation, but a common infection, minor injuries, will not be able to treat by antibiotics because the central dogma is failing to protect it because the mutations. So this is a cartoon came in New York, I think, that if you have a you have methicillin resistance, drug in antibiotic resistance, then you are running away from the whole place. So these are the different positions we get all these targets and where the infection is happening. So I showed you the structure. Structure I, I will not discuss very much, in, but there is no commonality in the structure. But there are certain delta signs from which one can define the structures and look at it. So all these inhibitors, we know how it works, we know where it binds, we know what center dogma, where the mutations, we know everything. Not everything, or at least the major, majority of the things which will define our structure. But the process cannot be stopped. We are not being able to modify the process. I know exactly, again, I'll try to give an example of COVID because it's a current problem here. I know where the virus, I know the drug which is killing the virus. I know the mutation which the drug cannot kill it. But how to stop that mutation, we don't know yet. We are in a major issue with that. So this is the same problem. Center dogma is affecting, we get affected, but how to handle, how to control that, we are not able to put it. One of the major reasons coming for that is that biofilm information, that there is a there is an organism. On a surface, it forms a biofilm. Biofilm of bacteria, we call it. They get attached to the surface, and these biofilms are extremely resistant. Antibiotics cannot penetrate. So these are very paraphernalia. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, mycobacteria has a very strong cell wall, and we worked on this for a very long time. We show how the antibiotic passes this cell wall and goes inside. I take a lot of help from organic chemistry. Organic chemist, Professor Jayaraman, who is a carbohydrate chemist, but a very good carbohydrate chemist. Me and Professor Jayaraman collaborate, and we have, a, we have grants from the Department of Biotechnology to design inhibitors, design inhibitors which will against this non replicative form of DNA, of, of non replicative form of bacteria or mycobacterium tuberculosis where I can handle the tuberculosis bacteria which are forming biofilm, which has the cell wall is altered or which are non, not growing. And these are organic molecules. We design the organic molecules. We have several publications of this also, how you can design them. It's a different story altogether. I'm not going to talk about it. But this is a pure chemistry where we can manipulate many of these molecules assembly by generating structures which will inhibit them. And we are trying to attack them non-replicative form of the DNA by bacteria. So we have arabinomanan, model of arabinomanan, which will attack the biophilia, inhibit phagocytosis, colony morphology, exciting motility of the bacteria, etc. I'll not go further on this. So this is another thing we are trying to look at, the variation, the response of bacteria across the microbial spectrum. This is another very interesting area now coming where we can use microbiota and spegmatis as a model system because they are very much similar to tuberculosis in various ways. They have short generation time, non pathogenic, reorganized tuberculosis, promote, recognizes the antibiotics, promoter glycosylates, replicates. So they are in non infectious, but for classic model, we can work on them, but they are very much similar to the tuberculosis. So in doing that work, we found out, this is the last part of the talk I'll give you in another, before I finish, that there are proteins which counter the rifampicin action, and you know how it binds. So there are called RNA polymerase binding protein A, we discovered that, and several other groups, streptomyces, silicolor, tuberculosis, pegmatis, everywhere it is there. This particular mo molecule, we have purified the molecule and we showed that it binds to polymerase and rifampicin action. It inhibits rifampicin action. Did in fact search for the protein? We, after the search, we did that pure biochemistry. We cloned, expressed the protein, purified the protein. We get a very pure preparation. And we showed, I will not explain these slides very much, in, but all of the microbiologists in the audience will understand that we grow the organism in different 
condition, concentration, different condition. And in, in the presence of rifampicin, in the presence of rifampicin, they don't grow. Inhibition of growth, you can show that the colonies are gone. But if I have the protein present, that protein counteract rifampicin action, then the growth again resurrects, it comes back. So that way you can assay the whole process system. And we know now how the molecule work on the protein and we publish several papers on this and not go very much further on that. And we showed the transcription activation and rescue of our, rescue of rescue of the organism can happen. So the assay is very simple. You teach it, we treat this organism, we grow the organism and then we add rifampicin and show rifampicin resistant mutant. But we show if we don't have the resistant mutant, we add this protein and show how this protein inhibits the growth of the organism. Rescue the growth in the presence of the inhibitor. So you play around with this as the inhibition of the rescue of the inhibition by the rifampicin and also by the another protein present in it. So we did the transcription assay, RNA polymerase dependent transcription assay over DNA and we look at the presence of protein, how the transcription can be rescued. And we did a lot of stress studies on this and for over several years and we showed how this protein can react. So we know that I showed you before, these are the classical mutation which give rifampicin resistance. And we now show that when the protein is present, different presence is rifampicin resistant mutant, how they can counteract by the, this mutation of the protein in the presence of these different proteins in the mutated organism. So result of which what we now know, we have a very significant contribution on this matter, this area, that how the rifampicin inhibits, how the, how the mutations are generated. And once the mutations are generated, how this mutation can be counteracted with another protein present in the system. So you know the binding pocket and we can play around with the protein, which is we purified called RBPA and how it can bind to the protein interaction site and different sites we have identified and at different concentration of the inhibitors. So these are the, if I'm, and we have purified RNA polymerase from different sources. You can see that the enzyme composition, enzyme structure, more or less in the same and different resistant mutants. And these different resistant mutants, therefore, can be worked with different RBPA. We can, this is called the IC50 value, that means 50% resistance, how much you can generate, different strengths of mycobacteria. These are all worked to it. We have the modification of the rifampicin. We have made three, two different kinds of modification. One is formal rifampicin, which binds RNA polymerase. It's a very good drug candidate. Binds RNA, mutated RNA polymerase and whether it can, re, it can stay alive. In the case of dormant or which are anti-inhibitory those can be treated with formal rifampicin. So we identified the structure of the molecule by different spectroscopic tool. We did several techniques and in the conclusion I'll say that we have identified the different resistance strain which have different potential in the presence of other antibiotics present in the system. Finally, the structure of the molecule has been designed now, not by us, by some other group. They showed the NMR structure of this particular protein. You people are working on NMR, you will know. This is a very, very important tool to define the molecular structure. And once you know the structure, you can go and look at how it binds to enzyme and how the resistance is formed. So therefore, I'll stop my talk here. And what I'll tell you that what I try to tell you how the central dogma has been generated, how it's been conceptualized, how every part, how important it is, and how every point of central dogma can be a drug target, how the resistance can be created, and different facets of it, how different protein can be used to treat this central dogma steps and can be worked on. So I stop here and take your questions. This is the structure of the protein, and this is the campus where I work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for this very informative webinar. And we learned how this central dogma affects the antibiotic and how it causes antibiotic resistance. It was really a wonderful work. And uh, now uh, I request Dr. Kiran Patruni 
to uh, carry forward the question and answer sessions. Sure. So thank you, uh, Dr. Nidhi ma'am, for giving this wonderful opportunity uh, to conduct the question and answer sessions. Uh, although I was listening very carefully, uh, like it is a brainstorming session for like uh, the, the students, for all the students as well as faculty, uh, like it includes the so much of informative slides, starting from the historical prospects, like uh, receiving a Nobel awards and the person who is missing. Okay, so that really uh, motivate all the students to your friend circuits like that, that one day you'll reach to the Nobel platforms, okay, Nobel Prize platforms. Uh, so we have received a few questions from the students, so I just read uh, one by one. Uh, so this is a, one of the questions from the student, why HIV retrovirus does not follow the central dopa? HIV does not follow? Please repeat the question. Central dopa. No, it uh, why the central HIV dopa. retrovirus no, it forms the not polymer. HIV is a RNA virus, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So it's a reverse transcriptase makes the DNA and then it follows central dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. So it is following exactly the same thing. Only there is a is RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So exactly like COVID, COVID is the same thing. RNA dependent RNA polymerase, it makes the RNA, depends on the RNA, it makes the DNA and then DNA makes the RNA to protein. So your modern vaccine, modern vaccine of COVID is the RNA virus vaccine. That's why you need a low temperature to make it. It's a very unstable molecule. Thank you, sir. And uh, the next question from Hiten. So he is, he has a concern like how uh, like uh, tuberculosis infects in lungs and forms a cluster-like structure, like infections. Exactly. Good question. It is exactly like biofilm. I showed you a slide. Biofilm is a characteristic of a bacteria when it attaches to a surface, like catheter, like your any other insert in the body or plastic surface or inside in a cell in a membrane it in one comes and then it accumulates the other accumulates the other because of the organization of the cellular structure and these cellular structure together they make a biofilm and no antibiotic can penetrate them so they become very infective so that's how their whole they, it is the survival mechanism when they are replicative, they're, they're individual. They're growing very fast. But when they're under stress, when food is limited, they come together. They call koram sensing. They talk with each other. They come very close to each other. And when they come too close to each other, they form a biofilm-like structure. There's a new phenomenon called koram sensing. So if you read more on koram sensing, you will see what I mean exactly. And they become very, there's a survival tool for an infective organism. Sir, uh, I have like, I was personally uh, concerned to ask uh, one, one question from my side. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about the uh, DNA or the central dogma of life as well as the formation of biofilms. So is mechanics like uh, for delivery of the, uh, like, or for this during uh, all the central dogma, is the biomechanics also plays a role, like a uh, rheological or extension rheology where we can very exactly... Good, very good question. Very good question, Harry. Harry. Yeah, sorry, Kiran, right? You are Kiran. Kiran yeah. Yeah. Very good question, Kiran. In fact, it is also an area which is the upcoming molecular mechanics of the flow of information. If you are interested, I will suggest you go to Nature. Very recently, they have published a review where they said that mechanism and the rheological property of a cell depends upon the polarization and the exclusion. And these are areas which are now coming up. People, the young person, like must work on these areas. How the rheological property guides the polarization, separation, and guides one movement of information in the direction. And that, if you can track that, you can follow many of the infection matter, infection possibilities. And also the non-replicative stage, which I was emphasizing so much. Because they become so smooth, sliding motility alters everything. So there's a rheological property changes. That's one has to address. Them. Okay. Absolutely nothing is known about it. Not much work has been done. But the idea is coming up like macrobiome. Because uh, that's one of the uh, interesting areas, uh, where uh, this uh, specifically DNA molecule showing the longitudinal, uh, like uh, longitudinal yeah, rheological properties. Yeah, very much right. Like a regular stress. It also packed up. It also gets packed exactly. up when you have to coil up. So this transition, when it's necessary to pack up when you have to elongate, this transition is very important. It's a very important area to teach to the students. 
sir uh, like uh, internally in our college also college system we have seen like being a faculty so over here uh, in chemistry we have involved biology uh, from the starting from uh, like uh, all the cell parts we are teaching and for the biologists we are teaching chemistry and of course some places where we are also introducing bio materials so uh, as a cumulative uh, like sir you have already crossed the journey so this is from the question from the student point of view like uh, what do you suggest sir like to understand or uh, to build a career in molecular biology how this cumulative uh, like subjects combination will help for the uh, choosing a research career is absolutely important i must tell you indian institute of science started undergraduate program and i was one of the person who worked very hard for this program and we started in 2011 For, from 2011 to 2016 six years five years i taught undergraduate first course ub 101 first biology course and i wanted to impart biology and chemistry together for the people who are not exposed to this bsc and the most important training i do that i got is that the, this interdisciplinarity of the chemistry and biology is so important for them to understand what you are talking about rheology is very important for them to learn a biology student should understand what is chemistry organic chemistry they have to know the structure nothing you can do without knowing the structure the mechanism of the structure when i used to teach this course when i tell people sn2 reaction people used to look at me what is sn2 reaction i have to teach them a chemistry of what is sn2 reaction they must learn thermodynamics you cannot exist without knowing thermodynamics thermodynamics the acidic river equilibrium thermodynamics they have to learn it at this they have to have by heart know what is thermodynamics what is organic chemistry what is structure that helps the biology students very much and vice versa sir i this is my question from your very interesting talk that i understood is that uh, the, from the central dogma certain proteins are being synthesized which uh, inhibits uh, which causes this antibiotic resistance Like. so sir uh, is there any way like we can uh, uh, one way is we develop a drug against these proteins and inhibit some of the uh, formation of this protein and yes. sir i wanted to know like how, how through my molecular biology approach uh, we can um, like we can make changes in the some some things can happen that uh, the dna doesn't produce such protein or something like that no what will happen you know yeah. that is another problem is a synergy yes, if sir. something is only bad you can kill them but it is not only there may be other function which are important Who, you know which is bad which will never be created if, because that is not necessary for you so when it is there may be other function they may be acting one or two together so at the and whatever you are having that is also survival of the bacteria so if you remove them what you, there are also good bacteria bad bacteria there are commensals if there are bacteria commensals which are very good for your existence if you kill this with protein then they will kill that bacteria also so it is bad for you so there is a nice balance there which has to be maintained okay sir so are there any more questions can you Uh, yes one question sir uh, that is from the uh, like uh, to connect like kendrashil university with uh, ia uh, sc because uh, sc bangalore is very uh, it's a hub of its very old institute from the research point of view uh, is our students like graduates or master students uh, uh, is there any facility or any kind of uh, like uh, very much very much they can come for summer program okay sir. so that was really we are going to support from here yes, and uh, we, we can show the all the facilities also sure is very much possible <laughs> Uh, thank you, sir. From uh, from the questionnaire point of uh, like uh, all the questions like resolved. And uh, yes, if any student uh, they can post their questions. If you uh, my email ID is there, you can send me any. Doctor okay. Nidhi has my ID, so you can send me any questions. So with this, I am thanking you, sir, uh, once again for that uh, wonderful session, brainstorming session. Okay, and over to Nidhi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor Kiran. And now I invite our H. head of department bioengineering uh, dr vijay singh to give his concluding remarks on the webinar today dr vijay singh uh, 
respected professor dipankar chatterjee uh, uh, this is the really uh, uh, we thank and you systematically go through this molecular biology what we believe the molecular biology is the one of the uh, major and the backbone of the entire on the all top of the biology so we we understand molecular biology because the, it is very very key and essential uh, field and if we understand what is the dna how to the rna and the protein how we can convert into the form of the product so most of the research is going through this either dna based research rna based research and the protein based research so if we understand very well how this system is going to happen and you went through the very very systematic understanding where the dna was started how the wilkins uh, watson creek they analyze realize and build this model system and receive the nobel prize which is very very informative and uh, sir uh, for your information i went through this nature paper is only very beautifully written i think three or four references is only there in that paper and rest is like story very good story in a very very easy language and i ever read such type of the nature paper in a very systematic and easy language where the dna model was published in the nature so uh, at the beauty of this dr vijay yes sir last paragraph if you remember they mentioned this people call it is the most humble statement of the history that it has not escaped our notice that the two stand separate and the rna comes out of it we are giving a statement about the whole biology for the oh, next yes which is going to be yes sir and you presented a lot of things about how we can inhibit and uh, it's very uh, important to controlling the infection especially the bacteria uh, the fungus so we need to either target the dna molecule rna of course and the protein in order to inhibit the infection and you saw a lot of potential for the mycobacterium and this is not time to conclude our your things within the 2 to 5 minute of the time i am sure because you spend a lot of number of year to discovering this thing and as a experimental as a molecular biologist we can believe it will take time and uh, of course the overuse of the antibiotics really is very bad for the normal cell even human cell yeah any bacterial fungal and uh, some of the states sir for your information they ban the use of the overuse of the antibiotics in the food product especially like the chicken or any other food product because they use for boosting the growth of the for the chicken and the fish tetracycline is one of the them when you give this tetracycline it is growth uh, accelerator for the fish farming shrimp farming and uh, they use also the number of antibiotic for the chicken farming and uh, maharashtra uh, the rajasthan and mp and even the gujarat now they ban the use of this antibiotics in the food product where we want to control so this is the good and uh, we now consider not to use a lot of antibiotics because the whatever antibiotics you, you are going to give it will uh, give this little stress to the bacterial system and the bacteria is very happily accept this minimal dose as if as a food and mutate the dna where you are targeting for the binding and they are happily change the behavior and within a 30 minute the cell can replicate and make the another so this is the one of the challenging things and we are facing a lot so what you saw every five year after the discovery of any antibiotics for the prominently kill the infection but now they get the resistance because the persistent or the dormant of the stages also help to again repropagate and regenerate with the super power full bugs will come again so it is difficult to treat them so this is the very Uh, not good condition what we face all the time so bacteriophage you already told it is the beginning of the 90s they use for the therapeutic application until the discovery of the antibiotics and now uh, after the five year you we know this is the antibiotic resistance is going to happen so bacteriophage this is now one of the 
alternative way to treat the infection, especially the bacteria, because we also using the antibiotics. So antibiotics is broad spectrum sometimes used and we kill all the, even the beneficial bacteria which may present into the gut and we disturb all the physiology. So in order to specifically kill the bacteria, now the phase therapy is have the license from the US FDA and uh, it is, this research is going to be more and more in near future as an alternative of the antibiotics to kill the MDR pathogen and uh, we can come with the solution. And, uh, and you saw number of the antibiotics, whether you can target either the DNA, RNA level, or the protein synthesis, so inhibit the bacterial growth. So this research is going on and on and now we need to find out more better solution where antibiotic resistance can be, be down and uh, we can control for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis, you saw the things is, is drug resistance, then you start with the multi drug resistance. So you need to have number of the drugs, number of the antibiotics to target different, different location in order to completely block the uh, infection. So these things is coming more and more. Bacterial genome is so flexible genome. Whatever you are going to give, it is going to get the resistance, it is for sure. So we need to be careful and we need to help to the society in order to not use too much of the antibiotics in the food, in any other product. So the antibiotics should be used for the infection when we have. So less concentration can help to the treat the disease. Otherwise, it is more dose is required and the resistance is going to be more. So you beautifully explain systematic way where the central dogma molecular biology is going to involve, how we can control the growth of the bacteria and how the mechanism is going to happen. So I think uh, this information, this knowledge will be very useful for the, all the participants who is there here. And uh, you know now the one of the most uh, and the good Molecular biologists in India who explain all the things at the level of the very, very atomic level where you can see the interaction of the where specifically the drug is targeting with the particular amino acid with the graph, with the plot. So, sir, thank you so much for the beautiful and the very systematic presentation over here on the molecular biology. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vijay, for your concluding remarks. And now I invite uh, the young faculty, uh, mole our molecular biologist, uh, Dr. Ritu, to convey a formal vote of thanks on behalf of Indrashil University. And I thank you, sir, so much for accepting the invitation. And it's my pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Ritu? Thank you, ma'am. So uh, on the behalf of our university, I be glad to convey my sincere thanks uh, to Professor Chatterjee. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and taking time out from your very busy schedule. Thank you so much. We are really enlightened with your concept knowledge. I'm sure that our students must have been found it very interesting and also relatable. So thank you so much uh, for sharing your vast knowledge and I'm um, Really thankful to Dr. J.S. Yadav, our provost, and Dr. Bharti Dave, Dean School of Science, for inspiring and encouraging all the time. Dr. Nidhi Gaur, uh, for her work hard to make every event a success. And Dr. Vijay Singh, Dean Research, for concluding uh, the session very nicely. Dr. Harin Gosai for the great introduction, Dr. Kiran Patruni, all the panelists, our technical team, all the participants and the students for their active participation and for asking questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Chatterjee, sir. Thank you so much. Dipankar. Yes, sir. Yes. You know, let me tell you, I heard you in, uh, of course, ICT Auditorium. <laughs> in the yeah, this, uh, academy meeting. But this time you have really made it very simple. Even the non biologists like you can understand. <laughs> I can explain. I'm sure our student must have got, you know, uh, must have understood. 
what a biologist can do and what biology can do. So it may be very helpful for them to choose the career. But really, you made it simple, okay? Thank you very much. Complex subject, simple. <laughs> <laughs> very simple. As you know, some of the slides when you're showing, then I was, you know, those structures we have worked in ISET, yeah? most of them. You know, the structures I keep only for you. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> You have such a strong organic chemistry group there. So, no problem. so those are rifampicin, rifamycin, all other things. Right. Have, uh, we did <laughs> in ICT, we have done this. Okay, then we'll say goodbye and uh, we we'll meet again sometime. I hope someday we will find time to come. Okay, I'll definitely come. Our business is all over. Sure. They have become senior citizens now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. Nidhi, sign off now. Thank you so much, sir, again. Thank you. I'll sign off, okay? I learned a lot from today's talk and all the students also learned. Thank you. Thank you, sir.